You may have seen a document floating around that is an event FAQ for Games Workshop's events. This isn't an actual FAQ for the 10th edition of Warhammer 40,000. This is about how it is at competitive level, tournament level, and only Games Workshop's events. Think of it more like house rules while playing at Warhammer World. But it does give us some useful guidance. More what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. Since it isn't an official FAQ for everyone. It's pointing you towards rules as intended rather than any kind of rules as written. And when I've been telling you the rules and tactics, I follow along as intended as best I can. So if you followed me, there should be no shocking surprises. But there's a couple of things in this that are a bit... Ah, uh, okay. And allegedly, the rules team is only allowed to make a couple of changes at certain points in the year. So this is unofficial. But it may be that come January, when the rules and points and things change again, 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 this is where we'll see them become official rules, so you may want to get used to them now. We have the question and answers that mainly affect the Gene Steel occult, question and answers that mainly affect the sisters, and one or two that affect both, so bit for every one of the two main factions that I talk about. Gene Steel occult first, and let's talk about demo charges again. Demo charges are once per game for that unit. If a unit gets into a truck and throws their demo charge while inside the truck, the rules of firing deck being that the weapon is passed to the truck and the truck is the one that's firing it, so the model, in quotation marks, that is firing the once per game weapon is the truck, not the Acolyte hybrid that was holding it. So the argument was the Acolyte hybrids could then get out and then still have the once per game weapon because they, as a model, haven't thrown it. Unfortunately not. There is one demo charge and it doesn't rematerialize in your hand when you get out of the truck. This is of course separate to the demo cache that is on the truck itself. So logic abides that there is only one demo charge there. You can't throw it, get in the truck and have it back. You can't throw it in the truck and then get out and have it back. So let's do a recap of demo charges. They are once per game. If a model throws their demo charge and then dies and returns because of the banner, you don't get your demo charge back. If the whole unit is wiped out and you pass your cult ambush test to get the unit back, that is a whole new unit and has new demo charges. Some tournaments say no, but that is their ruling, not general games, and that tournament ruling is not a Games Workshop rule. If you throw it and get in the truck, you don't get a new one. If you throw it in the truck and get out, you don't get a new one. So assuming that Cult Ambush is a whole new unit, that is the only way to get demo charges back. The Nexus, a unit that has gone down in use quite a lot, because now you can only get free stratagems on battle tactics. The command point reroll is a battle tactic, and so you could use that on something like a mining laser that's in a neophyte squad and reroll the damage on that. The argument was, who is targeted by a command point reroll, as it doesn't specify a target, but I think people generally understood it was the unit or model that was making the attack or the save that was doing the command point reroll, and they couldn't use it while battle shocked. Now we have the clarity that, yeah, command point reroll is a battle tactic, and so it can be used for free by the Nexus, using the Nexus ability. What if we want to deep strike in the first turn? Following the Leviathan mission deck and generally how people play every mission, whether it's crusade or casual or whatever, you don't deep strike in the first turn. However, if your opponent goes first, then at the end of their turn, you could use Return of the Shadows to remove one unit or two battle line units from the board and put them into strategic reserves. When would they come back? Well, following the main rules idea that you can't deep strike on the first turn, they would only come back in your movement phase of your second turn. This is saying, if your opponent has gone first and you have used Return of the Shadows, your units come back in your turn one at the end of your movement phase. So this isn't about the Primus redeploying units. That's fine. They would go into strategic reserves and still only come on in the second battle round. This is just things like Return to the Shadows where we have the deep strike ability. We go into strategic reserves and then we come back deep striking in our turn one. So if you had a unit that was really badly positioned, you could use this to get them out there and straight back on the board for your turn. The Primus lets you redeploy some units, but when redeploying, you can't redeploy infiltrating units using the infiltrate rules. This is... Not quite the logic I was expecting, and it's somewhat of a big thing. Gene Stealers don't want to be in front of a Flamer unit. Aberrants that have used the enhancement on a Biophagus or an Abominant to infiltrate don't want to be facing down a Horde. It isn't good for their low number of attacks. They want to be crushing elites. So with the Primus ability, you'll either have to take that unit and put it underground, so it's in Strategic Reserves and Deep Strike, or put it back in your deployment zone. You won't be able to move it around in No Man's Land. This is for Games Workshop's tournaments only, as it kind of defies logic. But we may want to go with it for now, because it's probably what our opponents are expecting, and you could decide with your opponent if they have, say, four boss marines with a four boss captain, whether you're doing redeploy with infiltrate, or just redeploy into your own deployment zone. There hasn't been any further clarification on when the Primus ability triggers. Most people seem to agree that it is before knowing who has the first turn, because it's a, an ability, so you could argue it was in this step, rather than being straight after this step. But for our infiltrating units, this is a bit of a blow. When a unit 
counts as having made a move, this document is saying it hasn't actually made a move for the purposes of triggering certain abilities. So ambush markers, if a unit deep strikes within nine inches of them, they count as having completed a move. And under this wording, that wouldn't be enough to remove our marker. But I think this is only going to apply in the most edge cases, where an enemy unit deep strikes within nine inches of the marker, and we have just enough position so that we can deploy a model touching the marker, still nine inches away from the enemy, which is where we need to be, and get all of the rest of the unit within three inches of that marker. If the enemy had done their deep strike seven inches away from the marker, something they could totally do, then we're not going to be able to place that first model in base contact with the marker while also being nine inches away from the enemy. In that case, you wouldn't be able to deploy the unit, but you would leave the marker on until presumably the enemy moves even slightly in their next movement phase, and then the marker would disappear. But it also affects the Reductus Saboteur. If an enemy deep strikes, it doesn't trigger her bomb ability. If an enemy gets out of a transport, it doesn't trigger her bomb ability. I can be okay with that, but it is a little bit illogical. And remember, this is not a fully introduced FAQ for all games, it is for tournaments only run by Games Workshop. It doesn't even apply to any international tournament circus events that you may go to. Just play your own game sensibly and have fun. When I'm looking at rulings like this, if I'm winning the game, I am more likely to rule in my opponent's favour just so the fun continues and they don't feel bad. And if you're thinking, hang on, we're talking about Deep Strike and Deep Strike doesn't count as having completed a move. Does that mean we're safe from Overwatch when we Deep Strike? No, no we're not. That still hurts. Overwatch specifies also units that are set up. So disembarking and deep striking strategic reserves, they can all be hit by Overwatch. So if we're thinking of Overwatch, we're thinking of fire, we're thinking of the Battle Sisters now. And the use of Big Guns Never Tire and pistols. So this section is saying that you can't use Big Guns Never Tire to fire Overwatch while you're in combat. Big Guns Never Tire lets vehicles still shoot out of combat even while they're engaged, but that's only in your shooting phase. This is saying that the Big Guns Never Tire ruling on that doesn't affect things like the enemy movement phase and the enemy charge phase. It had already been in the rules commentary that other abilities like the Infernus Marines, they don't get their special rule to cause Battleshock when they're firing Overwatch, so it made sense that you couldn't be in combat and shoot something with that Immolator Flamers through Overwatch. Big guns do sometimes get tired. So if someone charges you, you can fire when they declare the charge, as long as you're not in engagement range already, just not when they end in base contact with you. Same for Seraphim pistols. I saw no reason not to fire the Hand Flamers and importantly the Inferno pistols that are now in range once the enemy is in base contact with me rather than when they were like seven inches away, so out of Inferno pistol range. So your pistols can still fire Overwatch, just not at the end of a charge move once the enemy is in base contact with you. So do it when the enemy declares the charge, assuming that you can see them. Outflanking immolators and getting units out of transports. As most people were playing it, you have the movement step of the movement phase and then you have the reinforcement step of the movement phase, with movement and disembarking presumed to be happening in the movement step. Most people weren't having a transport come on from reserve and then disembarking in the same turn. And this section of the document does say that is how it works. You can't disembark in the turn you come on from strategic reserves. It was a nice idea. Come on from the side where you're needed, get some retributors out and re-roll to wound against something very important with no chance for the enemy to ever hurt that vehicle. Well, you can't. And if you're wondering about drop pods, if we had Dominica pattern drop pods, drop pods have their own rule on their data sheet that lets them come in on turn one and the unit disembark immediately. So drop pods are not affected by this. Command points. There is a limit of one bonus command point per battle round other than the command point you get at the start of the command phase. Junith gives you one command point in the command phase. I was treating this as the one bonus command point that you're allowed. But people were arguing that because Junith gives you the command point in the command phase, it was exempt from the max one command point limitation. It is not. So if you use Junith to get an extra command point, that is the only bonus command point you can get that battle round. Other ways you could get a command point are by discarding secondary objective cards at the end of your turn, or in Crusade games, some Crusade abilities give you extra command points for being on an objective. So you can still get a command point at the start of your turn. Then you get another one from Junith, but you can't get a third command point by discarding a secondary objective at the end of your turn. Don't take this as, now Junith is pointless. She still gives you the command point. So you'll get two command points rather than one in your turn. You just don't get more than that. The clarification on Melters is a bit more complex. Melter is no longer a separate ability that does damage separate to the attack itself. So if you're firing at a Dreadnought that takes minus one damage, when you roll a one for your damage, it isn't one minus one, but going to a minimum of one to get one damage plus two from the Melter rule for a total of three damage. That was some extra head math you had to do that you don't need to do. It is one plus two for the Melter, minus one for the dreadnought ability for two damage. 
That is how most people played it. You don't need to overthink it. For any attacks that set the damage to zero, we follow the rules commentary. Set the damage to zero and then add two. This is not to be confused with something like, oh, we have no last cannons. A mining laser that does d6 plus one damage. That plus one isn't coming from a modifier of another rule. So if you rolled a six on that for a total of seven, that seven would be set to zero because it isn't an additional modifier. So here it is in a different setting. You fire the melter gun, you roll a five, you wounded, how rare, what a rush. You roll the damage and it's rubbish. Only now do you look over at your pool of miracle dice and see that there was a six right there. So how does this situation work with the command point reroll and the immolator reroll from when you get out of an immolator? It was generally considered that you couldn't reroll and then use a miracle dice on that reroll. Well, that time has passed. But in this and explicitly acts of faith, also the Eldar version, you can use a miracle dice on the reroll. So it doesn't feel as bad for you that, oh, I messed up. I should have absolutely destroyed that. I had the ability to destroy that. There's no way I shouldn't have destroyed that. But you got excited and got caught up in the moment and forgot. You still have to use a CP to get there, but it's okay. Now you may disagree that it's okay if you play a lot against Eldar and all of their rerolls, but at the end of ninth edition, we explicitly couldn't do that. So getting used to being able to do it again may take a little bit of adjustment. For both factions, when taking Battleshock from things like Chaos Knights and Death Leaper, we only take one test in the command phase. This is referring to units that are below starting strength. Sister players may know this as the plus one to hit time because of the Hello Martyrs detachment. But if you are also below half strength, as well as below starting strength, this is not forcing you to take two tests. However, you do still take two tests if something like the Shadow and the Warp hits you, which affects all of your units and is used in the command phase. So these are not add-ons for the rules commentary. This is not a true FAQ. It is a tournament document for attendees of that tournament. You can use it as guidelines and it may become part of the updated rules in January. If you use it or not, remember the purpose of the game is to have fun. Even if that no longer appears in the core rules as the most important rule, that is what I want you to keep in mind. We play for fun, not for misery and pain and suffering. Although we are still playing Battle Sisters. If you want to read this yourself, I've linked a copy in the description for you to look at. It is under the link to give me tip money. If you didn't know that that's a link there, it, it's a link that lets you give me tip money. And it was nice to do a video on the Gene Stealers and the Sisters almost working together without me having to pick one or the other side. So I will link a video for each of them now. My darlings and viewers, have a great day of 40k.